All right, episode four, Locals Only Podcast, here with Chef John Tabone from Bar Pazzo. Thanks for coming, John. Hey, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so um, I did one of your classes. So obviously, I, I've been to Bar Pazzo uh, plenty of times and never left dissatisfied. I mean, that place, you have it You have it at, at top notch right now. And um, I did one of your cooking classes as well. Uh, as a birthday gift for my mother. Um, my sister and I gifted her that for her birthday and we were all just blown away with you. So like, I couldn't wait to have you on as a guest. So, well, thanks. uh, very excited for this conversation. I think was it a, a, a pasta class if I remember right? pasta class. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I mean, just the, the wealth of knowledge that you have in all things that you are doing at that restaurant was, um, super impressive, but um, just to give the listeners a little bit of background on yourself, I guess, aside from being the chef and owner at Bar Pazzo, um, how'd you, how'd you get to that point, I guess? <laughs> yeah, it's, it was, you know, it's been quite a journey. Um, I'm cooking 30 years, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So when you say there's a wealth of knowledge there and, it, you know, I certainly have had a lot of practice, <laughs> yeah. you know, with, with some, you know, trial and error, mm -hmm. um, I feel that, that, well, it's all I've ever done, mm -hmm. for, first and foremost. Of You know, I've dabbled in, in jobs, you know, growing up with, you know, just like, just like everybody else. But my first le legitimate real job was actually out of high school in a restaurant called Celestino's, which was, at the time, pretty much the premier restaurant, along with a few others in the area. Mm -hmm. This is we're going in, we're going way back in the time machine to, like, 93. <laughs> um yeah, but I, I, you know, I took a position as a culinary apprentice, but that was basically a, a, a disguise for a dishwasher. Act, <laughs> right? um, you got to start at the bottom, I guess. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm glad I did, mm -hmm. you know, because once you muscle your way through um, the brigade, you know, you, then you have a better appreciation for everybody that comes in there, you know, to start the way you started. Yeah. A hundred percent. Where was so, that restaurant at? So, um, it's still operating. Oh, is um, it? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it's, it's positioned pretty much right between Scranton and Wilkes-Barre and DuPont, but it's okay. right off 315. Let me think of the name. I think it is still under the name of Arturo's. Okay. All right. And um, the present owners took it over after it was sitting there and it was basically just abandoned for a few years. Hmm. It was in between owners and a couple failed attempts. Ironically, I, I was thinking about looking into that space before Far Pazzo. Just was, go full just because, circle on yeah, the whole thing, because, yeah. <laughs> because the layout was awesome. Right. You know, the banquet facility in the basement and the things that were going on there um, for the time were so ahead of what was in Scranton Wilkesbury. Mm -hmm. The chef mentor, shout out Guy Zayner, uh, he was, you know, pretty much one of the few CIA graduates, Culinary Institute of America, mm -hmm. that, that were back in the area and was really trying to implement a lot of old fashioned or old school French technique in the front and also the back of the house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he had some consulting groups in there. There was servers in tuxedos. Really? There was people parking cars. Wow. Uh, we want to wine spectate. So it was a good first, it was a good first gig for me. Right. You know, because you really got exposed to a lot, a lot early yeah. and, and pretty, high level stuff. Yeah. 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 Instead of just going to take food production classes, which I did and then going to work at like a diner or something. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that was like really eye opening. Right. You know, do you think that set the bar for you high? Like where just immediately right off the bat, your standard is now set at a different level than maybe some of your peers because you had that early experience at a place like that? I, I think that plays into it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but also personal standards have a lot to do with that as well. Sure. You know, um, because, you know, working there and then, you know, taking the next step, which would be on my own with my my ex-wife at the time, at, at the age of 22, wow. you know, um, there was, you know, there there's a, there's a point where you're you're way over your skis mm -hmm. you know what i mean oh yeah so you know probably wasn't ready for that gig <laughs> but with you know a really determined work ethic and the uh, and the desire to keep wanting to get better yeah and maintaining being very humble mm -hmm. and not know you know and really keeping that ego in check sure 
you know? Yeah, um, you kind of figure it out trial by fire. and Yeah, yeah, and I was lucky to be able to do that, mm-hmm. you know, at a young age. But yeah, I did I did probably three hard years at Celestino's. And, you know, back then it was French military style in the kitchen. Wow. Like, you know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. It, it was, you know, very cutthroat. Yep. You know, very competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that's, you know, that's my roots, right. you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest adjustments coming to Scranton, you know, in 2016, that, that, that kind of culture is now gone, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it should be gone, right. You know, a little too much at times for everybody and too exactly. much pressure coming down. Yeah. Well, you think about it, that restaurants, you know, through the, you know, you're talking through the years in the old Escoffier days, the only way you advanced was out, was beating out the guy next to you or the young lady to your, you know, to the other side of you. Right. You know, you had to cook, you, you know, better, mm-hmm. work harder, take less time off. Right. Um, clean better. At the same time, trying to balance a good working relationship with them to an extent exactly. because you're trying to yes. make the restaurant a success, but also trying to Advanced. one up your peers all the time yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's a tough. weird dynamic right right for you sure know? yeah they're like they're your teammates and and you know you're gonna you know high five at the end of the night when you get out of good service but it was understood you know that it, all the hiring it was done within right no no one was looking for a sous chef and here's the interview process right you're just going up it the didn't chain. matter you know it didn't matter who Corey was if you wanted to work there you started off the way everybody else started off it didn't matter your credentials right you know and that was the culture then right you know and it's, With, it's that that mentality of this is the way you're gonna have to earn it you're gonna earn it right you know? yeah yeah that's that's neat though i think yeah there's something to be said for that type of culture and obviously like the world in general is mm-hmm. shifting away from that type of culture um and like yeah sometimes it does create gems even though um some people crum- crumble under that pressure but you know, diamonds come out of that pressure too. So you're right. Yeah. yeah it's a correct. twofold. And I, and I think that's, it's not just kitchens. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that was the way of, of a lot of different professions. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, you had to prove to ownership or corporate that you were worthy of that next position. Sure. You know, just like a military rank. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The best private's going to become first class sergeant, you know, so on and so forth. Right. So that was adopted in the French culinary. Right. You know, and that's what, yeah, that's what you were. At. So then was there anything in between, um, that and Bar Puzzle where I, yeah. I th- so from Celestino's, um, my ex-wife, her family, well, she was at the culinary mm-hmm. and I met her when she was on her internship. So the, okay. C- the CIA does, I think it's nine months, then six months, then another nine months, those six middle months, you pick where you want to go. Okay. So she just boom happened to be at Celestino's. That's where I met her. Oh, okay. So, hmm. um, those of you that are like, you know, ancient like I am, you'll remember that there was a restaurant um, down. Um, in, well, it's more. It's considered Plains, but it's more on the border of Plains and Wilkesbury, and it was called Cafe Nino. It was only there for a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. You'll know that because. It is now still, the space is still there operating under a restaurant called Isabella. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, so before Isabella, there was K Medici. Mm-hmm. That was the place that we ran. Okay. So Cafe Nino was, if I'm not mistaken, the Bonsante family who has the pizzerias. Well, they, I think they formerly, they may still have a few op- operating um, in the Wyoming Valley. Dino's Pizza, it might have been. Yeah. Their family had, um, a lot of Italy roots, Southern Italy roots. Mm-hmm. And that's where Cafe Nino became a thing. They had a chef from Italy that came over. Long story short, the chef got sick. He had to go home. Hmm. They didn't want to run the restaurant without him. So my ex-father-in-law bought that restaurant for his daughter who was at culinary. Oh, no kidding. So, yeah. So they needed a chef. All right. Just kind of worked she saw out. how I worked. Right. And I was already accepted to go to the culinary institute because my chef at the time wanted me to go up mm-hmm. there. And I wanted to go up there. Mm -hmm. I had way more than enough hours than I needed, you know. And as you know, like any trade, if you go to trade school and know the trade, you're going to get way more out of that school Mm -hmm. than just going there, you know, right out of high school and not knowing. Completely blind, yeah. Completely blind. When I went to take local food production uh, classes, it was very confusing. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize all the French terms and theory that was going to be involved. Like, I was completely blinded by that right so it was more confusing to me 
but working there under that chef, he kind of, you know, made it relatable. To right. A degree. Get you up to speed. And yeah, like, I was able to answer a lot of questions. Um, and I'm happy he was, was able to do that. Yeah. Sometimes know? I feel like learning, like when, when you're just applying yourself to it rather than learning in theory at mm-hmm. times or, or like in practice, I guess, rather than like true, truly doing the tasks, it's, uh, it's a whole different ball game. And, and yeah, like everybody learns differently. Like there's visual learners, obviously. Sure. So yeah, I feel like learning right on the job like that is yeah, and being steered one way or the other, right? You know, mm-hmm. and that allows you to develop your own kind of technique, mm-hmm. you know, within the realm of, you know, fundamentally right, right? You know, and then you could you could gather your own thoughts on, you know, you know, the chef wants me to do it this way, but maybe I would have done it that way, and now you start to develop your own, maybe your your own, uh, it, uh, I guess, identity, you right? Know? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the more repetition you get, yeah, you know, like like anything that you do over and over, um. Yeah, so then, you know, that that chef got sick, they they bought the restaurant, and then, you know, she was already moved on from Celestino. She mm-hmm. was already back at the culinary. And then, you know, convinced me and I thought, all right, I'll put I'll put culinary school on the back burner for a year mm-hmm. and do this because it was gonna be a you know, pretty much double what I was making. Right. Hard to turn down at that point. Hard to turn down, and I thought, I'll bank this money Mm -hmm. and have a little bit of an easier road because that school is expensive, and it's actually way more expensive now than than it was. Yeah. You know, like all education. Right, right. Everything's everything's always going up. So, But at that point, you know, we ended up dating after a couple years being there together. Small restaurant, like the kind of restaurant that – you know, I was happy to have as like my first experience, right. manageable, perfect introduction to having yeah, your own forty five seats, yeah. real elegant room, mm-hmm. ten seater bar, wine on tap. You know, we're t- we're talking, wow. you know, pretty pretty uh, uh, innovative for its time. Yeah, um, small menu. Uh, I was just basically doing my version of Celestino's food, mm-hmm. right? What else would I be doing at right. that point? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's all you have to work off and that's all I have put to your work creative on. spin on yeah, it. Yeah, put a little spin on it and and uh try to build from that. And I was lucky enough to have one of the line chefs that I was working with come with me to help me. So we we ran that place and we it was a it was a good run. I mean, we went from ninety six to I'd say two thousand two. No shit. 2003. Yeah, that's a good run. Yeah. Real good run. 2003. Yeah. And then with, you know, anytime you're in business with, you know, in a pressure cooker with family and then Mm -hmm. kids come and, you know, marriage and kids and things started to break down internally. You're right. Business. But ironically, when the lease was was finished at 1140, 315, um, we had to make a decision. And then we built another K Medici, which was down on down in Jenkins Township, which is ironically now my partner's restaurant. Really? Pazzo. Oh, yeah, so, okay. Wow. So Pazzo Pittston. So you didn't close I, the loop on the first restaurant, but you kind of closed mm-hmm. the loop with the second. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Pazzo Pittston 315 was was my ex-wife and I. We've de- we developed that wow. to be K Medici like like 2.0. Really? And, and that's when things started to really dissolve internally and mm-hmm. then i moved we took a, a like a hiatus and moved to massachusetts moved to boston really yeah for how long uh almost a year really yeah i did i just i'm like if we're gonna take a break and take a step back i'd like to take that opportunity to you know be exposed to a bigger market mm-hmm. go work under chefs because at that point i was in charge for how many years right and i kept you know i'm push constantly pushing myself yeah but you you become, you know, a victim of your work. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're a hamster in a wheel. Right. It's not necessarily complacent because you are pushing your own boundaries, but sometimes without the outside exposure from somebody else, it's yeah. tough. And you're in the same environment every day with the same people. Right. You know, with the same you, missions. Yeah, you need to be influenced by other people at times. Big time. Yeah. Especially in, in I mean, influence is what creates creativity, mm-hmm. right? You know? I was just having this conversation with one of my my lead cooks and it's you know you know it takes it takes all those influences and it's not just chefs you know it's mm-hmm. I feel the best parallel would be musicians yeah. and cooks mm-hmm. it kind of works the same way yeah I can be- see that I've been around a lot of musicians in my my life you know so I see the way 
it develops, you know, the more influences you have, you know, the more of an identity you could possibly have. Less mm-hmm. influences, you just become, I guess, an off a, a derivative of those people. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Like as a cook, if I if if I keep blinders on and just keep doing what I'm doing, I'm just going to be doing the same thing. You know, with maybe the end a of few time. different ingredients seasonally. Right. You right. Know? Yeah. Where you know, if I travel, um, pull myself out of the comfort zone a little bit. Um, exposed to different culture, Mm -hmm. you know, different, you know, different places on the planet, you know, even just taking a step back around here and and taking a few days off sometimes helps. Yeah. And, you know, going to to some of the local restaurants. Yeah. I wanted to ask you that, like, where, where did you find a lot of your um, influence in terms of just your stuff? Well, obviously like the, the, I know you mentioned like the French like regimented style but in terms of um when you started creating your own menus and everything like that like what influenced you the most yeah i mean that that's ever that's always evolving Mm -hmm. you know people always say what's your signature dish you Mm -hmm. know and i'm like you know i always answer it the same where i'm I'm, my signature dish is what i'm really passionate about at the present time right you know like you know you, you ask you know somebody who's a writer you know, um, what's the favorite, what's your favorite thing you wrote? He's probably going to tell you the most recent thing. Right. Every time, every time. Yep. Right. Um, so I feel that that could be adapted with culinary as well, because Mm -hmm. it's an expression of what you're really into at the moment, Mm -hmm. you know, and if, you know, if I'm studying a certain style of cuisine, you know, I'm trying to apply that, you know, in a tasteful way on my day to day, Mm -hmm. um, or do a private event and try to, you know, really, you know, hone that in. Yeah. Um, Do you think that's what attracted you to the profession? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just the constant creativity. Yeah. I could never do this job um, where I was going to work every day and, you know, make, make uh, like chicken marsala for 300 people on a day to day. Right. And then look at contracts and be like, all right, tomorrow we're prepping in, you know, uh, you know, a roast tenderloin for 300 people. Mm -hmm. Like I would rather work in a, in a, in a, um, custom wood shop or something something that i would be able to like be proud of yeah absolutely instead of a redundant like cook in the military kind of mindset where you're just looking at contracts right yeah that would be awful so i'm very lucky i went the the route i did because some people at a young age they get steered into that Mm -hmm. and then they they realize it gives them a bad it gives them a a negative i guess outlook on the industry yeah absolutely you know? and it gives the industry a bad name because you know then it then you know they, they might tell 10 of their friends how awful it is or something you know right you know but yeah i'm, I'm very fortunate to be steered in the, the right direction at a young age to allow me to you know follow that creative path of work versus you know a redundant you know path of work where now i go to work and it's what I want to do anyway. So mm-hmm. it doesn't really feel like work. You know, right. people say that if you're doing something you love, it doesn't feel like work. Well, that's true. It is true. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very blessed. I'm very, and I'm very blessed to have, you know, the resources around me now, you know, cooking has made a really nice life for me. Yeah. You know, that's, and, and I don't, and I don't think it's, it's the fact that it's cooking and my approach to cooking mm-hmm. together has made a good situation for me. That's exactly know? what I was just going to say. I feel like when, when people approach what, whatever industry or profession it is, and if you're just in it to make money, maybe you would have went a different route. Like you could have made more money doing something else, but because it was your passion and you stuck to your guns and wanted to do it your way because you genuinely loved it and loved the creativity of it, maybe the money doesn't come as early but eventually it does because of your passion and your willingness to work through it and make the sacrifice and make the sacrifices up front and then eventually be able to blossom later and then reap all the rewards of those years and years of work beforehand. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you want to, you know, you want to trickle that mindset down to not only the young cooks, but also my kids, Mm -hmm. you know, like, look at, you know, this is, you know, this is a good example as your father that, you know, that you could, you know, follow something you really, really love. You got to love it though. Yeah. You got to love it, you know, because if you don't, you know, those long nights, those holidays and weekends when you're putting the time in and, you Mm -hmm. know, everybody else in your family and your friends are doing their thing. Right. The normal stuff. You're, you're, you know, you're doing your thing and you're working when most people are off. Right. It's, it's honestly though, 
that is the reason why I asked you to sit here today because it is so evident, like within five minutes of meeting you in person, it's so clear that you're so passionate about it and you just like live, breathe, everything about what you're doing is, it's so evident immediately and that's why everything is so good. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, not I, trying I, to I, give you all the yeah, flowers so I'm, early here, I'm but glad, I'm 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 glad that that I get I guess that that is evident. I'm glad that that shows, you know, because I don't think about those things. Right. You know, it's I just think, second nature to you at this point. Yeah, I, mm. I, you know, I I I think about what's what's the best thing I could possibly do today to set the example for my team, uh, to make the best food I could make today. You know what? You know where where could we collectively at Barpazo work, we work on things to become better, mm -hmm. you know? And that's the thing too, like when you, and that was, that's a hard adjustment even to this day is when you have a restaurant, are you creating a business for yourself? Or are you creating a job for yourself? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's still a, like a, a tight rope for me. Yeah. You know, because there's a lot of days I just want to go in there put my head down and just cook. Right. I, I, I you, literally you, had that you know? in, like as a mental bullet point, I, I wanted to ask you what the difference is between being a chef and then being a chef and owning a restaurant. Like how much where it's like, everybody kind of says like, sometimes like find your passion and turn it into a, a an uh, avenue where you can make money. And then, like you said, you'll never work a day in your mm -hmm. life, but sometimes it does go the other way where you turn your passion into a job instead of a business. Mm -hmm. And then you, you could potentially grow to hate the thing that you once loved, depending on how you structured up front. So I, I would be curious to get your mindset on all of that. Yeah. And, it, and like I said, it's a tightrope, mm -hmm. you know, cause there's certain days I just want to be the sous chef, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to have multiple calls before I even turn my you know phone <laughs> on and and you know things of that because it's a puzzle you know we're in a restaurant it's certainly a puzzle mm -hmm. you know what guest per what guest perception is on most nights is not really a, an indication of how things were two hours before we right. open you know right. it's how you pull it together yeah. you know I, and and I, I one of my servers that we had prior when we first opened he was in show business and he's like this is a lot like show business you know what I mean he's like <laughs> I believe you it. know who didn't learn their lines and yeah. you know who's yeah. you know and you got to figure it out out, you know but yeah it is 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 certainly been a, a challenge for me to go in there and think about a what is going to be the best decision for for barpazo mm -hmm. you know what's going to be what what decisions am i going to make on a day-to-day -day that's going to be the best for the bottom line mm -hmm. right because as a you know as a chef de cuisine or an executive chef your your main focus is getting the most out of your team mm -hmm. you know obviously you're thinking about food costs and that nature but you're really focused on you know culinary things kitchen right. things maximizing you know? their potential and yeah, yeah yeah so as an owner you're thinking about the big picture of things mm -hmm. you know um you know you're looking at numbers a lot more yeah you know you're thinking about less is more a mm -hmm. lot more mm -hmm. you know um what moves the needle right you know where's the money going to be best spent mm -hmm. you know you know, who might not be the best fit for the company, even though they're a good person. You right. know, these are decisions that as, you know, as you become wiser and have more experiences that you could kind of develop, but that's an ongoing thing. I feel, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you know, at the end of at, at the end of every day, we're, 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 you know, culinary is never going to stop evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the world of food and drink is never, you're never going to know everything. Mm -hmm. So you might as well just consider yourself a student of it. And just, you know, jump in there and do the best you could do. And, yeah. and hopefully you could make the best decisions based on your experiences, you know, uh, you know, your life experiences, not just your experiences within the restaurant. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. I think that's a really good approach and, and probably why you're seeing the success that you are and, and you still love it the way you love it. So, um, yeah, it makes sense to me. Well, we, we're, where we were at is we were talking about the dirt, the journey to Scranton. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where we were at. Cause, yeah. cause I had that as a benchmark and I'm like, all right, it's a bullet point with a journey to Scranton. So, yeah. so we could circle back to that. Oh, we're at the, at the K Medici at that point, And then up to Boston, mm -hmm. up to Boston. Right. right. And that, at that time was the, my son was my firstborn son. He was only one and a half. Wow. So that was the biggest challenge, right. you know? And juggling a lot of moving parts there yeah yeah picking like selling our house moving up there and 
my first time really out of the area for a long period of time mm -hmm. and my first time in a, a kitchen in a bigger market. Mm -hmm. And we're talking back to that cutthroat, right? Yep. Nobody cares about John Tavo. Nobody cared right. about my experiences. Nobody cared about... Your name isn't carrying no, as much weight as it did around zero here. Zero weight. Yep. <laughs> zero weight. So very humbling. Yeah. You know, but... What age are you then? Oh, roughly 28, 29. So, uh, yeah. So it's not like, so now I'm yeah, you're not like 22 and moving away. It's, and, and I'm working and you with a, a lot kid. of people that right. age. Yeah. You know, I'm working with a lot of people, 22, 24. Right. You know, some people, there's different countries you can't understand, mm -hmm. but we could really cook their ass off, mm -hmm. you know, and really hold their own. And, and, you know, and, and that's the thing with bigger markets. There's, there's, there's more. Well, there's more of everything, mm -hmm. right? So there's more cooks, there's right. more talented cooks, right. you know, there's more restaurants, you know, there's, uh, you know, more of everything. So that was probably the, the, for me, the turning point that was probably jump started me to get to the level I'm at today, because you're humbled, you know, and then your eyes are open to a whole new variety of cuisine. Mm -hmm. You know, you're seeing techniques you never saw before. You're in different environments you never saw before. Um, and you're faced with different, you're faced with different life decisions. you you weren't faced with before being 300 miles away. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a really bad winter up there. I was working at, at two really amazing restaurants. One was, uh, the main restaurant I was working at was grill 23 and bar. It's still running very successfully. It's the busiest non institutional steakhouse in all of new England. Hmm. So at wow. the time they had the biggest check average in all of New England. Really? And three sommeliers on staff. Like it was eye opening. Wow. We're talking four hundred and fifty covers on a Saturday. We're talking a culinary team of like thirty five cooks. Wow. Six sous chefs and I can't even imagine what Yeah, that and is here's like. me coming from Pittston. Yeah. <laughs> right. And now I'm trying to figure out how to fit in with that. Yeah. You know. And then the other restaurant I worked was um, a French Mediterranean restaurant that actually had a Spanish chef um, called Mistral. And that's, that restaurant is also still operating after almost 20 years. Really? So they were really established, two really good, yeah. well-run, well-managed restaurants. And they had really high standards. Mm -hmm. So you were held to those standards. And so, you were up there for a year, you almost said? Almost a year, play? yeah. Wow. Yeah, almost a year. And... and, and the one the one line chef I work up there I still have I still have a you know pretty much conversation weekly with him really yeah that's cool and and a lot of the a lot of the the chef alumni that was in that expediting kitchen when I was there all have opened their own places now really yeah yeah just How a cool breeding ground yeah you know it was a breeding ground for 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 uh Future young rent. talent right you know but it, it it you know you worked yeah you know you you absolutely worked the um but yeah, having that experience and then being able to finally come back and then eventually quickly after I came back, the restaurant was K Medici was sold to the Agolino family. Okay. All right, which is ironically my partners now. Wow. Sam is my partner. Right. He was the he's the main reason. He was the visionary of Barpazo. Oh, okay. And we could talk about that and his sister Corrine is our controller. Okay. And she's also the controller at Pazzo and Pittston and Agolinos in West Pittston as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, two great places. You yeah, know, yeah. You know, and and um, so yeah, then and then my daughter was almost born, and we made we struck the deal to, for them to take it over, and I was contacted by Full Circle again, Chef Zayner, who was my chef at Celestinos, who really? was on the, he was on the board for, at Glenmore National for hiring a new chef. Really. And he's like, this might work out. Yeah. You're the first person I thought of, but your intentions. And Corey, to be honest, my intention was to just take three months off and figure some things out. Yeah. But out of respect for him, I went to the interview. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it was one of those things where I went to the interview with, with zero nerves because I had no expectations, right. nor did I really even want to be there. Right. Wasn't counting on it. Didn't need it. Yeah. Per se. Per se. And I'd never thought, oh, my, 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 first indication of a country club chef was not nah, you guys are a bunch of wimps mm -hmm. you know right. what little did i know yeah right? <laughs> yeah because i'm thinking oh you're 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 serving the same food that a golfers you know right you know a private club or a dining club whatever sure. yeah. you have a limited audience mm -hmm. you know i think at the time they had 500 members wow. right so i'm like oh how hard could that be right you know but then you know i you know country club chefs 
lifespan or a private club is usually a three, three year lifespan, mm -hmm. you know, because you're cooking for the same people and eventually they want something new. Right. Right. So I gave it a three year window when I, you know, I thought this might be a good fit because all I've ever known was having my own place. Mm -hmm. And Zayner sold it to me as you could, you could have your own place here without the headaches of having all the back end financial problems, right. and family involved, have the creative freedom as a chef, but yeah, not but, necessarily but not, not have the, the financial, I guess, burden mm -hmm. of, you know, those worries, which well, I, you still have them, but not to the point where it's, you th you're thinking about, you know, you're not getting paid for a month or something like right, that. Right. Right. Yeah. You're still going to get paid and, and yeah. it gives you, yeah, kind of the the freedom that you need to operate and, and kind of spread Especially your with little kids. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? for sure, yeah. So my ex-wife at the time was all about that job. She's right. Like, you know, because people line up for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're obviously some of the better paying positions. Um, they're budgeted well because the, the revenue streams are not only coming from the dining, but also the if there's golf or if there's tennis. Right. Right. It's fairly fixed. Yeah, the, and, an and the budgets are 50, you're 50, you're on the 50 yard line every year with your budget right. before you even serve a, a dish of food, right. you know, because yeah. there's so many built in. It's interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah there's so many built that. in uh, weddings mm -hmm. and, you know, golf tournaments that are already three years booked out. Right. So you can, it's the, the outlook on the, on the finance part of it. You know, I learned a lot there too for right. that, for that end of things, for yeah. the finance end of things. You yeah, know? definitely. Um, did, how, how long did you spend then there then? Yeah, I did 10 years there. 10? 10. So you gave years. yourself three, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tripled and, it and then some. <laughs> and then some. Yeah. Yeah. I never, uh, it's even weird to think that because now a couple of times, you know, I have a really good relationship with the chef there now, chef Mullen and, 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 and the GM there, Melissa, um, you know, at times I'll stop there for plates and silverware for events. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, and I'm walking <laughs> the kitchen. It's like a time warp. I'm like, man, I can't believe I spent ten years. In you know? Yeah, that's because wild. you're like you're you're hidden. You're not only hidden from the public, right? Right, but you're hidden in those mountains of the montage. Yeah, nobody knows you. A hundred percent. You know? Yeah, you fly under the radar big time. There. Yeah. So a lot of the events that I do now are basically I've done before for the you know, for the private, right, you know, there, or, yeah. and I just, you know, especially when Bar Pazzo first opened and we would do like theme nights, mm -hmm. their nights, their kind of themes that were like basically offshoots of what I used to do at the club. Oh, really? But they, no one knew about it. Right. You know what I mean? Because, because it, yeah, you're limited. Your you're, audience is private. limited. You're right. Yeah. yeah. You know, That's and interesting. nobody wants to go there. Right. Like if you're, you're like, if I invite you and be like, Hey, I want you to come to my event. You're like, yeah, I'd love to come to my event. And then you walk in there and everybody's looking at you like, who's right. this guy? Who's this guy? He doesn't belong. Yeah. yeah. You feel like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. You know? So, and, and it's not even because they mean to, it's just because like, it's right, like it's somebody natural. walking into your house. Right. You know, yeah, that's yeah, their you're, house. You're used to the same faces yeah. for the last five years plus yeah, probably. That, that's so. their, that's extension of their house. Yeah. You know? Huh. That's interesting yeah, to so think about. A lot of things happened in those 10 years. Yeah. You know, I gave myself three years and then boom, the economy fell apart, mm -hmm. you know, and then everybody was holding on to their jobs. Right. So we didn't know if we were going to lose our jobs. Yeah. You know, and do, do you think like how much did having two kids at that point weigh into your decision and in, in taking that? Yeah. Some, some level of stability there. To, yeah. And, 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 and okay. Well, got you a position back in the area. So mm -hmm. you were moving back from Boston and it was, yeah, like, I just feel like sometimes that's what you need. But also, like, I wanted to touch on, like, isn't it funny how it, you, don't you, you could pinpoint, like, a few things in your career, whether, not even career, like, personal life, too, where it's just, when you're completely taken out of your comfort zone, whether intentionally or unintentionally, it, whether it could be a, a breakup or moving somewhere mm -hmm. or whatever it is, like, the, that's, it's like a breeding ground for success. Like yeah. you need to, for certain people, for certain people. Yeah. Yeah. I could have went down some bad roads mm -hmm. for sure. And a lot of, a lot of people in this industry do, mm -hmm. you know, that you're faced with hardship and it's cause we're all it, to do what I do. You're all, you were all addicts. Mm -hmm. You're a, you have very addictive personalities, right? you know, and it's how you could steer that, you mm -hmm. know, because it's, a, it's, it could be a, it could be a, um, it could be a bad road. Yeah. You know, slippery either. slope and very like, slippery, very slippery slope. Like and most it, commonly like mm -hmm. Anthony Bourdain, like you hear stories like that. Like he struggled with it forever. Yeah. But and also it, is like a gem of a human being. And it's like, yeah. It's, and, he, it's, and, those, and, and those demons followed him. Yeah. You know, Big those time. demons followed him. So yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's part of, I guess the, the, the 
chef culture, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, unfortunately it's your support system, you know, and your ego and things of that, that how you navigate that and your priorities. Yeah. So kids help that. Yeah. You know, because if give you some structure, yeah. And, and you, if you care, just like anything else, right. you have to care. Yeah. You know, obviously you should care for you about your kids. Yeah. Right. If you don't, there's something wrong. Yeah. Right. But you know, my care, my kids are so dear to me that, you know, every decision you make after they're born, you think about how you're, they're going to see that. Mm-hmm. How would my kids see that mm-hmm. for the most part? You, you know, there's going to be times where you're impulsive and maybe mess up a little bit, but if you could try to keep that on the forefront of your thoughts, right. I'll keep you maybe on the, on the, on the right railroad track. If yeah. You will. Yeah. You know, go in the right direction. Yeah. hundred you know? percent. Um, and you know, I'm very lucky. I have a great, great, great family, mm-hmm. great supportive family of two, two amazing brothers, two amazing sisters. My parents are both still alive and oh, they're both awesome. still together. That's great. So yeah. Yeah. yeah that always helps. Yeah. 1000%. Yeah. But you to know? your point, this is apologies. Anybody who made it through four, this is, Three out of four podcasts, the times I'm saying, <laughs> this is uh, the fourth time I'm saying it now, but in terms of parenting, so much more is caught than taught. I heard a comedian say that maybe a month ago, and it's just one of those things that stuck with me like glue because it's so true. How you were saying earlier where you followed your passion, but you, it wasn't, you know, you you weren't ever a starving artist. You followed it with intention and you wanted to pass that down to your kids, how, how like, um, displaying that was important to you and then everything you're saying now just about caring for your kids it's it's never about what you say to them and you know like you could tell them until you're blue in the face like you need to just work hard at this job and and it'll it'll work out in the long run but they're only gonna absorb 10 percent of that but because you're doing it in real life and you have them involved in what you're doing they're i mean absorbing 120 percent of it yeah, it, I, I feel that if you haven't, you, you should, as a young person, try to work in a restaurant at some point in your life. Mm-hmm. It's a good airport job. Yeah. You know, I don't, you know, you know, a lot of good people after COVID have, a lot of my good chef friends have left the industry because, you know, they, whatever direction they, they pivoted in life. And a lot of people did, mm-hmm. but to have those experiences of working in a, in a restaurant and in that environment and, and a good restaurant, I don't mean. Right. I don't mean like, you know, a sloppy place. I mean, a restaurant that kind of has their act together. It, it, it's right. a good stepping stone for a young person, forces you to think on your toes, mm-hmm. forces, it, forces you to be social mm-hmm. in uncomfortable situations. Um, and it exposes you to a lot of different walks of life. Sure. Right. Yeah. A lot of different people, a lot of different personalities. Yeah. And I know? think like, and there's the teamwork part of it. Right. And that, that that's kind of where I was going to go. Like, the chaos that is a kitchen, and I, I I, mean, I was only, I was a waiter, and it was my first job. I was a waiter in high school at a diner, nothing crazy. But, and then I was also a waiter in college for one year at Elmer's Country Club. And um, just the chaos that is a kitchen and being able to operate under those circumstances, and I'm just a waiter, I'm just going in and out. I only got a glimpse behind mm-hmm. the true work that's going on in the kitchen. It is, like you said, a breeding ground for and just gives you a different appreciation and a good structure for whatever endeavor you take on after that because it gives you a whole new appreciation for the level of work that goes in and goes on at any restaurant and like you said managing personalities and being able to yell at somebody because the stakes are high in a kitchen and not take it personally and still get through and have a successful night or something like that um you're not getting that that intense rush for three, four, five hours anywhere else like that, no, especially for like entry level exactly. jobs, like you said, just yeah. to try it once. And yeah, for sure. And, and the other, and, and I'm glad you're saying that because you could have an appreciation for it, but it, there's also the people who don't understand that, mm-hmm. you know, and that's okay. Right. You know, there's, there's people that, you know, I get calls sometimes and, you know, it might be a, an attorney friend or a doctor friend or, you know, whatever friend. And they're like, oh, my son's in for college and you can give him a job, you know. Mm-hmm. And then already I take a step back and I'm like, well, I'm not calling you to give my daughter a job at your dentist office. Right. Because automatically the people that don't know just think that they discredit what you do. A hundred percent. And they think that, oh, oh, it's a quick summer job. They could go in there and make some tips. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of, Barpasso, there's 90 days of training right. 
for you to go down the floor. Mm-hmm. You, you'll, you'll get on the floor before that, but you're not getting your own section. It takes you about 90 days right. to learn the space, the system, the, you know, the people. There's too much on the line for you. Like there's so much yeah, work I'm that went into it. I'm not going to throw you in there because then the, you, how are you going to represent what this company right. has, has built? You could mess up mm-hmm. 10 people's experience in one night. In one night. And you're never going to see those people again, potentially. And, and, and you, yeah, and they'll, and they might tell 10 of their friends, right. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, some people are understanding, but if, if I could avoid that train wreck of a situation, mm-hmm. we have the training uh, system in place where, and, and that's another dynamic that's hard. It's hard to train when you're busy mm-hmm. because you know, you're first coming out of your first team coming out and you're, you're opening a restaurant and you realize, wow, this is, everybody's geared up. We have a month of training you know, and expectations are super high and you only have one chance to make a first impression. Well, if you, if, if you're an experienced group and you understand that you're probably going to open up great, Mm -hmm. but then eventually people leave. Mm -hmm. So I don't, there's not one person in the kitchen that's opened bar Paza with me. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're trying to mold new talent as you go while maintaining the standards and being busy. Right. And that's another challenge part of it too, you know? So that's why, you know, when new people come in, they seem like they're a good fit. A rig, it, you know, it's, there's a system. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to study the wines, the food, understand why things go with each other. And then the space where everything goes, you know, how to take a reservation. There's every little detail. Mm-hmm. And then once they pass the test, then they're allowed to have a smaller section. And then, you know, they're kind of, they're watched, you know, mm-hmm. see how they perform. And eventually they'll sink or swim. Yeah. You know, so. it's so interesting to hear everything you just said though, because I would say 90% of people listening have no idea that that level of training goes into being on the wait staff or anything at your restaurant because, or at any restaurant for that. But I don't, I also don't think that every restaurant, not even close to every restaurant is doing no, what you're and doing. I, and, I, and, and it gives the, it gives the industry a little bit of a black eye mm-hmm. when you hear somebody come in from a different place and be like, Oh, we didn't have to do that. I, you know, I'll, they showed me how to use the computer, and the mm-hmm. next day I was waiting tables. Right. I'm like, well, you know, that's why that place is run like that, and your yeah, place is run yeah. how it is. And that's that's why you'll get a consistent dining experience at places, and you won't at other places. Mm-hmm. You know, if you that that brings me to a question. My sister wanted me to ask. So I, my sister is like fascinated with you in the restaurant. Um, probably. Se- before we we did the experience with you, uh, the theme night of the pasta the pasta night um, with our mother, but um, she wanted me to ask if you could have if you could pinpoint one feeling that you want everyone to have when they leave your restaurant on any given night, what would it be? Very happy. Easy enough. Easy enough. Yeah, because that's that it, it, without even hesitation. Just because that's why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. I want, I'm in the industry to make people happy. hundred percent. And I'll ask mo very few chefs that I interview. I'd be like, why do you do what you do? And you know, I could tell you 75% of them are going to say, because this is my passion mm-hmm. and I love being creative and that's great. Mm-hmm. But very few will say, because I really enjoy making people happy right. with my skills. Right. Right. And if you could, it's something as simple as that. And I see people leave smiling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the server will come up to me and be like, those people were thrilled about everything. They loved, they loved the the suggestions. They loved the features. They loved the the excitement. It's a, it's a fun environment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very positive. And then that makes me happy. That makes me fulfilled as well. That's gotta be the best feeling. Yeah. That, that, that honestly, when I could sit here, if I had my two partners here and we could, and I could say, you know, what, what could we have done differently when we've opened, you know, cause you could always look back, mm-hmm. right. And say, you know, maybe we didn't need that second oven or maybe we didn't need this situation, or maybe we could have, you know, laid this out a little bit differently, but I could honestly say the main vision that we had collectively was to have an exciting restaurant that was vital and it, it was appealing for all walks of life. Mm-hmm. And I think you nailed that. And that was the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what could we create that you want to come in there uh, with, with, uh, with your fiance 
And then, but you're, you're also, your mom wants to come in there with, with her friends for a birthday right? or bring your grandmother in there mm-hmm. for an 80th birthday mm-hmm. or whatever it is, yeah. you know, or a 16th birthday party. Right. We've gotten every bit of that and always have gotten that since the beginning. Yeah. And, and that would be, I would say to them, like we've cheers, you know, we succeeded on that part. Yeah. You know? I would, I'll, I'll cheers you to that. All right. Man. <laughs> for sure. I need a splash anyway. So this is a like an mo of mine. Is that the phrase? Mo like mm-hmm. something that bothers you, or yeah. like a, whatever. Anyway, this is an mo of mine. Like where people obviously people love talking about people who are never going to open a restaurant love talking about like if I was ever going to open mm-hmm. a restaurant, like I would do this and this. And this. It's just so, it's fun to talk about like same way like if you won the lottery, like I would do this, this, and this. And um. I've been in plenty of conversations doing that, just messing around and everyone's like, yeah, but like you can't open a place like that in Scranton or you can't open a place like that in Archibald. Like there's people just aren't ready for it or whatever. Like this isn't New York city. And my biggest argument for that is like, sometimes people don't know number one, what they're missing or um, they don't even know what they want because they haven't been exposed to it yet. So, so that's where I think like when you walk, when I walked into bar Pazzo for the first time, it was, uniquely different than any other restaurant in Scranton to that point. Like you do feel like you're walking into a restaurant in a city in a, in the best way possible, but it's still very inviting and, and welcoming and like has that down home, like Scranton feel, if you will. Um, but I think that like your restaurant is just a perfect example of if you were having a conversation with people, maybe outside of your circle, they might think a place like that, you know, Scranton wasn't ready for it at the time, but because you opened it, um, with the rigor that you did and the structure that you did and how you, everything you just mentioned in terms of the feelings that you want to evoke and and who you want to cater to in that restaurant. Um, I just wanted to give you credit there because it's, it is easy for people in Scranton to say, you know, oh, the maybe the drinks are too expensive or, or this or that of or whatever. Course. But as long as the juice is worth the squeeze and it's worth it when you yeah. go in there and it's an enjoyable experience, people will always go. Yes. Yes. And and people could people generally could sense um they could sense the commitment. Mm-hmm. Um and they could also sense the consistency, which which is my biggest thing opening Barpaza was we need to be there's a lot of square footage here. Mm-hmm. We need to be consistent. And the goal was to be a neighborhood restaurant. Okay. Not Michelin star restaurant. Mm-hmm. I didn't want tablecloths. This, is, this would be my first restaurant job where it's not considered to be what people think is fine dining. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a loose term, just like the word chef. Very right. Very loose. Yeah. <laughs> talk about that. If you fine like. dining is getting looser and looser. It's getting looser, <laughs> right? So, um, but I wanted to have the, I wanted to have consistent food that had not only made with my identity, but to have a wine list that supported that Mm -hmm. and the drinks that supported that. And more importantly, 51% of that would be the hospitality that supported that. Right. The commitment to service, which is, I think sometimes, you know, left on the back burner for the Mm -hmm. most part, Mm -hmm. you know, what's, what are, what are your commitments to service? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and at times, I'll be honest with you. It's very rare that I'm driving back to music after a service. And I think, wow, we were clicking on all cylinders tonight. Right. Because, you know, I have a lot of perfectionist traits Mm -hmm. and it takes me plus 15 humans to walk in there to make it run bare bones. Right. It's a lot of human beings. Yeah. That's a lot of personalities. It's a lot of things that need to be checked at the door when you walk in. Yeah. I was just going to say like at any given day, if one or two people just have shit going on in their life and it's like yeah it could really mess things up messes up the whole team dynamic and and, you know that's that's part of being a chef is being a chief that's what that means it's Mm -hmm. being a leader and you're going to set that tone and you're going to make the adjustments and you're going to when those lights go down and it's time for service you're going to put the best people out there putting them in the best positions that they could be in to succeed Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day the guest perception is going to be wow that those meatballs tasted exactly the way they did last month and they were delicious and they came out on time and the server was beyond nice and she catered to everything that we needed or he or she right 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 and then that that makes 
me driving home saying, all right, we didn't, we weren't perfect, but not one thing came back and we had some positive, but the rhythm of the night might've sucked. Right. But overall, you, overall you get through it, mm-hmm. you know, and you live with it. Yeah. You know? Dude, by the way, you know, your meatballs, they're like, this is how I describe them for probably three years as like people were getting more familiar with Bar Pazzo. I grew up in an Italian household. My, my mother cooks, my two grandmothers, like my one, one of my grandmothers is from Italy. Like I've been eating very good yeah. meatballs and, and pasta. I think that's everybody in this area, yes. right? Right. So I'm not tough, unique. That, no, I, I mean, everybody has, has an opinion on meatballs and as, as you know, so that's a tough menu item to roll out. Right. right. And like my, so like, I would think like my standard is pretty high for, for good Italian food. I've been spoiled my whole life. When I had the meatballs at Bar Paz the first time, I'm like, and I, I, I voice this to like anybody I ever talked to about Bar Paz. I'm like, get the, get number one, get the whipped ricotta to start. Yeah. And then definitely, then the, yeah, of course. I mean, rightfully so. And then at the bare minimum, like for the table, get the meatballs and share them. I'm like, I didn't know meatballs could be that much better. I thought like at some point, like a meatball is a meatball. And you could only do so much to like change it up here and there. Mm -hmm. And then I had those and I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. Like they are exceptional. Little little chef's touch on it. Yeah, a little bit. Little chef's touch on the classic. (laughs) Yep, yep. It's funny how you say that with Rigotha because that was, that wasn't even supposed to be a dish. And it's like definitely, it's like our bread. Yeah. And it was, that was like, that was probably like three days before we opened. We're like, oh, you know, let's just add this because we need an outlet for pizza dough that needs to be used up. (laughs) right well that and worked that, out yeah and there you have it you I, w- I wanted to ask you about that too like it's like it's like the kind of the the, the band that goes into the studio and yeah. has to fill one more song and it ends up being their hit yeah like that that you they're know? playing that's the a, next 25 years yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's funny well that worked out that for worked sure. out that was one of the things that you look back and be like wow that really worked out yeah you know? how how fun was it crafting the menu because like like i said earlier like everybody talks about opening a restaurant and like i would have this 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 on the menu for sure what um what, and, go ahead yeah go ahead. the menu is is like i said about musicians it's like your record mm-hmm. you know it's like your approach you know you're gonna like i said 75 percent. you kind of know what people want to hear in that genre mm-hmm. and then you, you experiment maybe with 25 percent on what maybe you know what's trending mm-hmm. but it is it is it is, it is absolutely a, a a fun and exciting process but after cooking in the area for so long, you know, an old, you know, a, 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 an old wise chef named Jerry Pasikoff, rest in peace. He, I was able to cook with him at a very young age. He was one of the old Hoddles owners from way down in, way down in uh, South Maine and Wilkesbury back in like the 70s, right? Mm-hmm. So this guy, you know, I was able to cook with him for about a year. And he told me, he said, and it resonated. He's like, never, never forget who you're cooking for, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. Sure. You know, because, you know, you could be the best cook and have the best technique and have the most innovative ideas, but you can't use your customers to practice on. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. So when we opened Bar Pazzo, it was, and that's another thing you said about, oh, if I opened a restaurant. And, and that's one of the key things you have to ask yourself over and over again. I'm opening this restaurant because, mm-hmm. and they, they answer that right. every day, mm-hmm. because. And then answer it, mm-hmm. you know, and the more, the more you could hone that in, right. The more the vision becomes more clear. Right. Right. And we knew we wanted to do like, look, my partner, Sam, he's a visionary. Um, but he has Pazzo and, you know, he's a little bit older than me. He didn't want to be in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. You know, he needed somebody who could share that vision and it could actually pull it off. So when he approached me, you know, it was two years and it was two years of back and forth and business plans. And I can honestly say it was a fun, fun process to be part of because, you know, between him and I and his sister, there's probably a, oh, almost 140 years of combined life. And then we've all not, done not, nothing else. So right. it was like a very mature kind of process of getting this place together mm-hmm. and really not rushing anything and understanding, having experience in all the aspects of it. So it made that, that was an enjoyable, um, but the menu was always going to be about wood fired pizza, something that you could get your head around Mm -hmm. your, 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 your fiance, your mom. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was going to be about fresh pasta and it was going to be about homemade gelato and it was going to be about 
Italian wine. And that was the focus. And I, and I thought to myself, with our experiences and that as the core, we could, we could do really well here because yeah. it's very relatable things to people. Mm -hmm. You know, at the very least, if you walk into Bar Pazzo and you're like, wow, what is this? You could get a pizza margarita, a Peroni, mm -hmm. have a gelato, yep. and still leave happy. Hell of a night. It's a good night. <laughs> it's a good combo for me. That right? works, yeah. And and or if you're a little bit more of experimental person, that you're going to have something there for you. Yeah. You know? Um, so the, the challenge for me now has become my features don't really sell so well because people already know what they want when they're walking through the door. Right. Because we have so many signature items. Yeah. You know, and we're priced right with the chains. That's mm -hmm. the goal. So you have, when we're open, you could have that as an option. You don't have to go to a train restaurant. Right. You know, so people think, well, we could, that, oh man, I could go for that whip rigotha. You know, I could go for that pork chop. Mm -hmm. I could go for some meatballs. And then when they walk in, servers exhausting themselves to try to get you a feature. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, that sounds good, but I want that. Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Yep. So yep. it works a little bit against you, but I get it. Yeah. I get it. And, 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 yeah, it's like a... Uh blessing and a curse like it's yeah. good that people want those staples so badly but also like you want to create uh keep your creative going yeah, and those yeah, features to sell push, well because it's like bit. yeah you like, like again they might not know what they're missing but they're just afraid now because mm -hmm. it's like oh, if it ain't broke don't fix it just get yeah, the staples yeah. my attitude is the opposite <laughs> me too but i'm know, like i'm i always want to try try new something. stuff yeah yeah, yeah. and and I mean, that, that's that been, and it's more of a challenge because of the younger cooks that have maybe put everything on the line for that plate. Mm -hmm. And I've given them that, that spot on the menu for the night. Right. And then they're like, oh, we only sold six of these. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. don't get discouraged. Those six people probably loved it. Right. You know? Yeah. But yeah, you when you're selling. you can't control who orders it. Yeah. But when you're selling like 25 pork chops and you're like, man, you could get that any night. Right. But it's good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's good. Yeah. You can't what's, blame them. What's the process? You kind of touched on it again, uh, going back to the class, but you kind of touched on the process of having a chef um, get something as a feature on the menu. Could you expand on what that process is like? Like um, behind yeah, the scenes? Yeah. So for it, you guys? it starts. It starts with obviously a conversation. You know, chef, could we? You know, they'll they'll approach me and ask to maybe source some different ingredients. Um, I'm always happy to do that within the you know. The realm of you know being practical and um you know at the end of the day i don't want to experiment on my customers so there's a process and this is what kind of this process would kind of gain me to get to move up the ladder a little bit when i was in boston was i was allowed to cook family meals sometimes mm -hmm. which is a big thing in a restaurant like grill 23 yeah. you're talking 50 people are working there tonight right so you, if you come in at noon, you're spending your whole day cooking for 50 people. Right. And it's not just 50 people. It's 50 top tier. Yeah. It's Psalms, chef, yeah. chefs, <laughs> right. you know, your peers, you know. Right. So, you know, that's where it starts. A conversation. All right, let's get some product in here and we'll maybe work it through some, you know, we'll work it through for for, uh, for family meal. Mm -hmm. That's how that bikini bottom pizza ended up on the menu. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it was it's such a, a hit at family meal. Yeah. So and now it's not like surprised. People. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it starts with it starts with getting... Um, the product in, um, and given the, give, you know, given the, either the chef or, or a group of chefs, the opportunity to come up with a menu item, um, you know, let's run it through for family meal a little bit and then let's put it on as a feature mm -hmm. and then let's see how the, let's get some immediate reaction as a feature. And then if it's something that I think that it's, it, it's practical and it could be cross utilized in other places, because that's another thing when you're writing a menu, it's, you're not just writing a menu for one thing. It's like you need to use each ingredient at least three times. Right. You know, there has to be crossover. There has to be cross utilization. Get, right. And to write it, you have to write it in a clever way where it doesn't seem like it's redundant. Mm -hmm. You know, so the cooking method might be different. Uh, might be raw on this plate, but it might be cooked on this plate. Right. You know what I mean? Yep, but either 100%. way, you have to figure out a way because, you know, in your business, you know, you're, you're buying the highest quality. I mean, I know I wear your stuff. It's mm -hmm. the highest quality stuff. But your stuff isn't going bad. Right. My yeah. stuff's going to go bad in three it, days. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. So it's, you that's find a little bit of a different ways challenge. To use it. Yeah, you, oh, I could know. imagine. And food's expensive now. Yeah, yeah. You know, even the days of buying, you know, and we, we pride ourselves in buying the best we could find. But like even vegetables now are just... Through the roof. Lettuce is so expensive, you know, and it's it's not anybody's fault, but the economy's fault. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's... It, and for me... 
there's only so much I could pass along to the customer before I sealing myself out. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if you go food shop and you'll notice that. Right. You know? And and, and to, talking about expenses though, like you are, from what I understand, like sourcing some of the best ingredients you could get your we hands try. on. Yeah. Like, Cause like some of your stuff is coming directly from Italy, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Some of our, some of our Italian chicories are obviously some of our olive oils are mm -hmm. some of our vinegars our prosciutto right you know so it's awesome that's it that's important to me because if we if we're marketing ourselves as an italian restaurant not just an italian american restaurant mm -hmm. so obviously we have a lot of red sauce just like in every italian american restaurant but we're trying to do things that are you know indigenous to sardinia mm -hmm. or it or sicily or piedmont you know different regions that really aren't highlighted on different menus around here right so, um and it's fun because I have relationships with some of these people over there um, through the years because of our Pazzo. Right. You know? Yeah, so, that's neat. So, yeah, it really is neat. It, it really is. Uh, what, like what? I said, cooking has really opened up a lot of doors for me. Yeah, you know, no to doubt. Say the least. Yeah, you know? no doubt. What parts of uh, Italy, like in your travels over there, have you found to be the most influential? And maybe just in personal life, like what, what areas did you enjoy the most you know, because I've spent most of my time up in, in like Piedmont in the mm -hmm. Northwest and the, and the wine region, that's probably, well, it is the, the, one of the most prestigious wine regions on the planet mm -hmm. and to spend time up there and see what has to happen for you to get that. Like I brought you that Nebbiolo mm -hmm. to see what has to happen for me to walk in the house with that. It's right. just wild. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's why wine to me is I'm not a wine snob by any means. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't even have, I don't enjoy having conversations with people like that. It's funny to me. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're like, cut from that same cloth. You're doing too much, man. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but it is really interesting to see what steps, what factors have to happen mm -hmm. to get that to you in, in your house here. Tonight. Right. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's an appreciation. Yeah, from from literally the 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 year, the rainfall, the mm -hmm. soil, everything yes, that's going on yes. over there. Everything that's going on over there. Bottling it, obviously the whole wine making process, process and then yeah. just getting it getting over there. Getting in the yeah. bottle, getting it on a container, getting it in a ship. Right. It's know? awesome that we could get our hands on stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, we're but, lucky. Yeah. Yeah, we're lucky. But it's a process for sure. I got we did oddly enough, we did our honeymoon in Italy. Um before we got married uh, that's cool yeah different um but it was it was a heck of a trip and just going through and like some of the wineries over there in uh tuscany and stuff like we did all the kind of cliche like spots that you have to hit the first time yeah. in, you're in italy um but yeah you gain you gain a whole new appreciation, appreciation. for the winemaking process yeah tuscany is great yeah tuscany it's beautiful is great and and you know and that's that could be that was one of the challenges with bar Pazzo was we're going to be in an, an all Italian wine list, mm -hmm. right? We're, I feel like we we're, we're the only one who has done that pretty much right. at, at the level that we're at. Yeah. So the average, you know, wine drinker comes in and they just order, you know, what they like, what they get at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to our service staff to, to steer them and to be, all right, this grape has a lot of the same characteristics as maybe your, your, your Sauvignon Blanc or right. your Merlot, you right. know what I mean? Or your the things Sauvignon. you're normally liking, but maybe elevated. At yeah. And some try level. this. So I feel like it, then it becomes a little bit more of an educational dining experience too. If you're mm -hmm. op open-minded, right. You know, yeah. You know, it could go the other way. And so right. Maybe like, Oh, I'll just give me a Pinot Grigio. Cause right. everybody knows that. Right. You Can't know? be bothered. But yeah. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people though, now that, you're so established. I think a lot of people probably would be open to, to the suggestions just because you know, like stuff like yeah, this and, and, and your yeah. yeah. And like people get to know you and, and trust your guidance and what your team is, is might be referring or suggesting. Um, it, yeah, probably just comes with time as well. And some yeah. people who maybe weren't open to the idea, hopefully you would think might be because of what you've built. Yeah. Because of the experience mm -hmm. and, and the time spent there and, you know, the credential yeah for sure mm -hmm. you know any place that's established is people are going to be a little bit more i guess open-minded to something like that than, yeah. than a brand new place yeah it's know? like i've been there 10 times everything is great every time i'll, I'll, I'll trust them on this one for yeah, sure and yeah, try it out yeah you yeah. hope people are open-minded like that yeah you know yeah definitely how do how do you guys come up with the name See, Bar, Bar Pazzo was just a derivative of Pazzo. Right. So that was my partner's idea. So I let him run point on that. I really wasn't super concerned. Just as long as it, it just needed to be a classy name and it mm -hmm. just needed to be something catchy. 
Um, but we certainly wanted to have the word bar in front of it because we do essentially have three bars. We have a pizza bar. Mm -hmm. We have the wine bar, the main, the main alcohol bar, and then we have a gelato bar. Right. So w the, the initial plan, which didn't work out was to have like a cafe in the front to have like a little, uh, cause we, we invested a good amount in the espresso and gelato or, um, cappuccino machine and, mm -hmm. you know, the tables that would surround that. So as you know, come, going to Italy, you know, you could go in the morning and have mm -hmm. your cappuccino and Italian pastry. <laughs> Uh, to start your day off, mm -hmm. you know, so that was what we envisioned, but it was, it was tough to compete with the coffee market there. Yeah. You know, um, Northern light has Northern light. does a great, well, Dezo at the time was doing a great job. Mm -hmm. There's a Starbucks right over there. Yeah. It's tough. So, and especially, know. yeah, like changing the, the coffee habits is probably even tougher than it's tougher eating habits mm -hmm. because it's like, that's habitual for people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm not moving off of what I know. Um, but again, it's like, Sometimes they don't know what they're missing. <laughs> yeah, well, it was it was more of an. My first AM sous chef was a, a professional baker. He really wasn't a chef, so mm -hmm. we were like, "Oh, let's take advantage of his skills." Right. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. And I learned a lot from him. And and but we, you know we we stuck it out for six months, and it just didn't have enough revenue mm -hmm. to you know. But maybe it it's something it. you revisit now that we're established. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it, maybe in a different way. Yeah. Because you know. We, Corey, I'll be honest, we were open, I think, close to 75 hours a week before COVID, and now we're down to 25. Wow. You know? And, That's crazy. And it's an adjustment because it's never going to go back to that. Right. You know? It'll never go back to That's that. That's unbelievable. Just, just because of the mindset, the, the mindset of, you know, the I guess the, the, uh, the mindset for the restaurant industry, I guess, worker coming out of COVID it's a different mindset. It's more of, and it should be more of a quality of life uh, mindset. Um, you know, focusing more on, you know, you know, self health, things mm -hmm. of that nature. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That so, was definitely a big byproduct of the mm -hmm. whole COVID deal. And obviously like, I'm, I mean, just grateful you guys made it through. Cause like yeah, me what, as well. what they did to restaurants, I don't know. Not going to go down that road, yeah, but yeah, everybody I, I has their you. opinion, but I mean, just crazy, crazy. And I think it was all small business. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah, not just restaurants, yeah. all small businesses. But while other, and I mean, this plays right into my hand in local and like supporting mm -hmm. mom and pops, like while other huge corporations are able to operate under normal circumstances and then that's the only option for people to go and use versus the mom and pop stores mm -hmm. who are being told they can't be open, it's insane. Yeah, and it's not even COVID. It's a lot of them are, a lot of the 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 you know the mom and pops or the like the the legacy places are going away because mm -hmm. there's the next generation they've they've put them all through college and they've already went on to do something else so there's nobody left to take right. them over yeah you know yeah and, and that's kind of a sad thing yeah you know yeah for so, sure you know and then you put COVID involved with that and if they're not structured right on the back end you know they those those people didn't have no chance yeah you know yeah they have no chance I mean it's brutal and that's 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 kind of one of the things like one of the guiding principles for like my whole thing with, with the locals only project, like it's creating a relationship to the things you're consuming, using and, and frequenting, frequenting rather than just mindlessly using those things or, or eating um, those things where like, and that's what I wanted to touch on, like your community nights and theme nights and, and cooking classes that you do every once in a while. Number one, I guess, what was your motivation for that? I know you touched on it earlier and pivoting off of your time at Glenmara and um, kind of just repurposing it at Bar Pazzo. But also, I guess, like, what's, yeah, like, what's your driving force? Because for me, I mean, look at, like, all the, just, like, the little relationship that we have created f since taking that one class. Like, I introduced myself that night. I said, hey, like, I have this business in the area. If we could ever do something together, awesome. Like, I really enjoyed it tonight. Like, thanks for doing this. Awesome. And like now, for example, like my, um, my group of friends, there's like maybe eight couples every first Friday, we all go out to eat and, uh, somebody different gets to pick every Friday. And naturally like I pick Bar Pazzo and like, maybe I wouldn't, if you didn't do that class that night and now I have a relationship with you and like, I want to support John and his restaurant. Also, it's great. Like I want everybody, everybody in that group to experience it who hasn't yet. Um, but also it's like little stuff like that, where if you're not creating those connections on some level, um, whether it's your barista or, or anything, it, it's not just food. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like the, the, the amount of connections that 
that I'm sure you have made mm-hmm. by, by what you're doing and what I have made has, has been phenomenal, Yeah, you know, and, and it's allowed, like you said, for, for us to support each other, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. So next time I want to buy gifts, I, I, I look at what you have to offer first right. because I, I know it's quality and I want to support you, yeah. you know? And like you said, we wouldn't, that wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for the connection of food or like, like maybe, maybe that pasta class. I mean, I'm always trying to think of things that I could do, um, to push myself in uncomfortable situations, mm-hmm. me personally, just mm-hmm. because no one's pushing me really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously I want to push myself to be a better human for my kids and my staff and things of that nature. But from a professional standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, um, I don't have the opportunity to leave the area for a couple, like two, two weeks out of the year to go work somewhere and, you know, pick up some things and that nature. So, right. you know, with, you know, and that's one great thing about, uh, about the internet is, you know, you could pick up technique and you could take a class and you could, all right, now you could apply your own skill set and then eventually and, and and then work it through with some experimental stuff. Next thing you know, you have an event in mind, mm-hmm. you know, and then you could, you could, you could envision it and then you could think about all the details and then it becomes extremely fun. Mm-hmm. The process of thinking it through, it becomes fun. And then all the details, you know, what could I do? What's it, what's this going to, why is this going to be so special, you mm-hmm. know? And, keep asking yourself that and build and build and build. Yeah. And then the day comes, you have to do it. And you're like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get all this done by myself. Yeah. Mostly probably by yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I want to see anything, you know, yeah. so, yeah. but yeah, no, it's, it's a fun process. The education part is, is something that went, yeah, it goes back to the, to Glenmore actually, because it's such a seasonal line of work that you pretty much have a lot of new cooks in there every year mm-hmm. because once you lay them off, they're done, you know, right. they're going to go to the next place. So right. you, you found your, you find yourself teaching all the time. So, you know, I feel like that has given me enough practice and patience and I enjoy it. Yeah. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, I, I really enjoy it. And I think, you know, that, you know, that could be the next step for me, mm-hmm. you know, is, is, you know, really honing that in and, and, you know, doing, cooking shows and demonstrations and hands-on classes. Cause I really enjoy doing it. Yeah. And the people when, like you said, when you were done, you were like, man, we had a great time. Yeah. You know? So that's not going to stop. I'm right. going to continue to do that. Um, yeah. They're so cool. I, yeah, I, I would recommend anybody, like if you're looking for a gift for somebody or like a good date night, like sometimes everybody always complains, there's nothing to do around here. Not, well, like going to like spend the money, go on, take your significant other on, on a date night for something like that. It is the best. And like, even, uh, we did the barbecue one. We, we were right on, on the sidewalk in oh, front yeah, of your restaurant. Yeah. Like that was, it was barbecue night. And like, we got to meet a bunch of uh, good people. The food was incredible. Like you get m- way more than your yeah. money's worth in food and I wine and that, drink. It was yeah. like, it, it, they're, they're the best. Yeah. That's, that's my opening line. I'm like, remember this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. Yeah. The people that come to my events know that. I like, know. man, I didn't eat for two days in, in, in preparation for this event. I know. Because, and like everybody, you know, like brisket, like, uh, barbecue is not cheap. Like if you go anywhere, uh, I mean, you're spending like 30 bucks a head. Yeah, if you want it done right. Yeah. You know? and, and like, there like you're there was more than enough people couldn't take anymore and yeah, like, bo- like trying to box stuff and go home with it because yeah. it was so good but uh yeah i mean yeah, those sunday suppers have been fun you know it, it started as theme third thursdays mm-hmm. at the restaurant oh yeah and that was uh, prior to the the shutdown but it those grew fast yeah and we did I some fun it. ones you know but then it got to the point where now you're competing with yourself mm-hmm. you know because yeah we might have 70 people in there for the theme night but then I don't want my regular customers to suffer. And if we had a private event in the in the private dining room, right. they might wait a little bit longer because you know we. And and if people aren't on social media, they walk in they're like, "What the hell's going on?" Yeah, and I see people in these weird uniforms or something. Right, you know? right. So I right. try to how to separate them out. Yeah, you know, just because yeah, it's, it makes it got, sense. It, it got so popular that it it was now it's a, now it's a conflict. Yeah. So it was easier just to separate it out. Maybe once a quarter, I try to do do, do one. We did. This, this last dinner I did was um, a tribute to my voyage through Italy. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, I picked all my favorite wines, and it was, it was, it was so much. It was, I, I wish I could go <laughs> back and hone it down a little bit, but yeah. it was, I was so excited to, yeah. to, to, to have everybody to try all. every one of my favorite wines so, yeah. and, and, and the food that should go with those wines. Right. So, yeah, it was fun. And, and I had um, a large screen TV set up with actually um, 
you know, an introduction from the winemaker. Oh, really? In between the courses. That's cool. And to talk about the, the, the family, the history. Yeah. You know, that's our awesome. war. Yeah. So that was something different. Yeah. You know, now you can really actually cool. put it, uh, or here's the label. Here's the guy who made it. Right. You know what I mean? Virtually traveling there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. A little virtual travel. Yeah. You know? That's so, awesome. Yeah, that, that, that was fun. You know? So I want to do a circle back though. I know you were talking on um, the equipment that you had in, in espresso and cappuccino machines and stuff. Um, and I know you mentioned this again um, on the pasta making night. You got to share your story about what the effort you went through to get that pizza oven in the building. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, the street had to get shut down. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so, you're shooting a movie. In yeah, yeah, it really was. People, yeah. the news was there. Really? Yeah. So um, they, they come from Italy. They end up in San Francisco. And then that's where they were tiled. Hmm. Right. And then they're loaded on a, you know, 54 foot flatbed. Mm hmm. You know, all strapped in, all well crated in. So now you have to have, you know, your your, your forklift people there, your construction people there, and it it barely fit through the front door. So they had to take some wedges out. And then at the time there was no flooring in there. Mm -hmm. So now if we were to try to move them out of there, there would be demolition. Yeah. Right. So then they, you know, they're coming down the street. You know, people are wondering what the heck's going on. Right. It was it was super cool, like the wow. excitement of seeing something like that. Yeah, and then they, you know, forklifts loading them off the truck, and you know, the cops are there. You know, <laughs> yeah. It was just like wild, you know. I was like, wow, this is really happening. Yeah, you know. And then like the, you said, like wasn't the ventilation a huge problem too? With yeah, it? so you the had ventilation. To, like, spend all this extra money yeah, just to yeah. so run the ventilation. Initially, out. it was supposed to be vented right out the side of the building, mm -hmm. and then Scranton never seen anything like that before, and they were like, oh no, this is this this has to be chimney to the hmm. the, the the top of the Connell building. Building. so like whoa so then we had a, an extra yeah it feet. was an extra like honda or toyota camry yeah uh, tacked on to the budget yeah no big deal no big deal at that <laughs> point what are you gonna do right you committed you're committed you're like all right what else is gonna happen yeah. you know and then here comes the scaffolding team and sets the project back a little bit yeah it was it was the first initial spot was supposed to be lackawanna avenue and there was money spent over there hmm. for professional services and um you know, it it just didn't work out for whatever a, a lot of different reasons. Um, but you know, it worked out in our favor. I feel it put the project back a year, mm -hmm. but the space we have now, uh, the landlord we have now, the location is way better. Yeah, street parking. We're in one of the nicest buildings in Scranton. It's beautiful. You know, we have you know, eighty people that live above us that support us. You know, so it worked. It worked out in our. It might not. It might have been a rocky start and discouraging, but you know, it was. It was one of those things where we persevered and. Yeah. All right, and you know, you don't lose sight of the vision. Don't get discouraged, and you know, well, we, you know, you got you know, like anything, you know, you you gotta power through. Power them. through it, man. Yeah. Snow plow. How uh, how long or how hot does that oven get? Do you know? Well, at first we were thinking about being neapolitan certified like an avp like a um a, a, from napoli you know like there's only a few places in the the country that have that certification um but then af, you know after i'm looking into it i'm like this isn't going to work in scranton so we consider ourselves to be a neapolitan inspired pizza mm -hmm. not a true neapolitan pizza to have a true neapolitan pizza um you have to have a wood wood burning oven like we have, mm -hmm. but you have to burn it at a 900 degrees versus we're burning it at about 750. Okay. All right. Um, Does it matter what type of wood you use? Or um, do you it use doesn't matter. It no. has to be dry wood, yeah. kiln dried. Mm -hmm. So because if you put wet wet wood in there, obviously you're going to create a smoky okay. environment and your crust is going to be really undesirable and chewy and pale and mm -hmm. it'll be like steamed bread. Right. Right. Um, and that's not what you want to do with pizza. Yeah, no, you know, not, not that style anyway. No. Right. So the other factors of being true Neapolitan pizza will be, you have to use 100% DOP San Marzano tomatoes. You have to use, um, Italian flour, double O flour has mm -hmm. to be either Caputo, um, or a like, a, a like brand, but it has to be from Italy mm -hmm. and the cheese has to be from Italy and it has to be mozzarella di bufala not cow's milk oh, okay so oh, okay. there are the factors hmm. right so if you start tallying that up and i were to give you a pizza and i'd have to charge you 40 dollars. right it. yeah just importing everything yeah and, yeah the cost and, of everything is and, and crazy. since 2016 that's all those prices have almost doubled right you know yeah so and well, then good, at the, good thing you didn't go that route yeah, yeah. good thing yeah. right um yeah we would have had a pivot quick yeah right 
And then eating those pizzas in, in you know, experimental, I'm like, this isn't a Scranton pizza. It's mm-hmm. too soft. It's sloppy. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes our pizza even could be like that. Um, and we're cooking a little bit differently because mm-hmm. we're trying to achieve a little bit more of a durable right. crust that you could actually eat like a traditional pizza here mm-hmm. in, in Scranton. So there was a lot of experimenting, a lot of adjustments made. But yeah, for the most part, we're about 750 degrees um, throughout the course of the service. Um, wow. Cooking about, you know, if you're experienced pizza, all you could cook five or six at a time. Right. It'd take about three minutes once That's they're wild. dropped. Yeah, it's fun. It's quick. It's fun. But when you're on that station, look, forget about everything you, oh, you yeah. are locked in. Yep. Five hours. You oh, yeah. Be <laughs> yeah. You daydream for one second, you're going you're gonna to mess it up. Yeah, it's, you're going to have five burnt pizzas you're real gonna fast. You're going to have five or very ugly ones. Right. You know? Yeah. So that's got to be somebody that really, it, and that's a huge learning curve. Yeah. You know, because it's hard a, to stay locked in for that long. It really is. Yeah. I look at it as a challenge. Yeah. You know, but if I'm over there working that, I, I have no idea what's going on in me. Like, right. you, you, I could, you know, it does. You, you could ask me who was in the rush. I have no idea mm-hmm. what's going on throughout. I'm just listening to the expediter and then I'm just locked in, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't necessarily like to work that cause I like to have an awareness of what's going on everywhere in the kitchen. But sure. Obviously there's times where I need to, yeah. but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. But you got to be working on the business, not in the business yeah. at night. Like you, you, gotta... you try to, that's the goal. Right. You try to when, you know? yeah, when you can, when you can. Um, but that's a challenge because there's not a lot of places like Bar Pazzo where we could share staff. Mm hmm. You know, uh, people will come in and be like, oh, I have pizza experience. I'm like, oh, like that? They're like, oh, what's that? You know what I mean? <laughs> Never seen working, anything like Working that. a yeah. New York style deck oven, which is awesome pizza. Mm-hmm. But that's not that. Right. You it's know? just different. Yeah. It's different. So it, it's it's a lot of practice. Yeah. I'm actually doing a staff pizza class for my staff. Oh, yeah? I'm going to start that. Yeah, really? Just because I feel like the more exposure to the people that don't have the reps, it's reps. You need mm-hmm. to get the reps. Yeah. You know? So take advantage of these, these uh, wintry days and get people in there and you know it's good uh team building stuff too yeah you know yeah good hanging you know? out and yeah bring your friend everybody. with you yeah come a pizza you it's know awesome. what i mean yeah no brainer no brainer it's uh it's it's interesting how much time you put into your staff because i remember you also saying like um my sister actually asked you um because cacio e pepe was on the menu at one point and obviously was a huge hit i'm sure um across the board and then i think you took it off at one point and in that class she had asked you you know like why is it off the menu or or when is it coming back and immediately like without a flinch you're just like my staff's not ready yet until that thing is perfect and they could master it at, at consistently without missing ever it won't be back on yeah, the menu and we're still not there yet really but it did emerge as an arancini so we're on okay. the right we're on the right road <laughs> you get in there because yeah people people ask for it i mean but it's such a simple dish but when done correctly it's it's a fantastic dish it's exceptional you know? yeah but that's that i think that's just like that's a a little glimpse like those little instances like i keep bringing up stuff from the class but that's that's the level of passion i was referring to earlier where like it's just so evident that your ex your love your standard and your love for what you're doing is so evident because of stuff like that because probably i mean i I don't want to speak for other chefs i don't know that many but like i would say seven out of ten chefs maybe around here um might say, oh, that's one of our best sellers. We have to have it on the menu and like, we'll figure it out like as we're going. Yeah. Where you, you need it perfect before anybody's putting a fork to that. Yeah. And I, and I think that's one of the hallmarks of a real chef is mm-hmm. the standards have to be set high. Mm-hmm. And what don't, com- it's, and you, you should never want to compromise those standards for anything. Mm-hmm. You know, just make adjustments. You right. know, like, you know, yeah. I do I want to have that dish? Yeah. Um, could we do other great dishes that maybe, you know, offset that uh, um, demand? Yeah, we could do it. We'll figure it out, mm-hmm. you know, but the standard can't be sacrificed, right. you know, and that goes with anything inside the building. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, let's work the same way when it's, there's 250 people in here and, and we'll work the same way when there's 25 people in here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't, yeah. don't compromise. Yeah. You know? It's it, like I said, it is so evident, like even your drink menu. I have no idea what goes into to crafting your drink menu outside your wine, but like you're going to get drinks at Bar Pazzo that you're not getting anywhere else, at least in this general area. And it's nice. It's refreshing. It's something different. And for people like me, who, how we were talking earlier, like I don't want to go in there and get an old fashioned. I want to try something different like your tequila, whatever, with something spicy I never even heard of and mixed with grapefruit and some 
fruit I never I'm like and it's fantastic every time like my trust is with you and your staff and your bartenders because time after time after time it's always good so and even you know maybe people try something and it's just not for them that doesn't like it's it's usually because it's not because it's not good it's just not for them And, and that's and that's the challenge for a bar chef or even a real chef or a cook is that dish might be fantastic for five people, mm-hmm. but that six person, it doesn't work for their taste buds. Right. And that's, and that's hard for a culinary artist mm-hmm. because you're judged not only on sight, but you're judged on smell and you're judged, you're, you know, you're judged on, you know, not only the presentation, but the smell and then the taste more importantly. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the rule we live by is never mistake interesting for delicious. Mm-hmm. Cause there's a lot of people that can make something look interesting yeah. or make it sound interesting. Yeah. But the standard is delicious. Let's right. start with that, right. and everything else will kind of support that. Don't get baffled with bullshit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to an because extent. I mean, there's been there's been times through you know the, the evolution of culinary and the, the you know the way the history repeats itself. It's like the wheel, you know. Mm-hmm. But there was some stages there where it was all about what was the most interesting and what looked the coolest and like the, like the magic on the plate. And mm-hmm. that all has a place. But a lot of that could be wow. Look at we made bacon and eggs out of powder and this mm-hmm. smoke and like that's fantastic that's super cool but man i just want bacon and eggs right you just give me bacon and awesome. eggs yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah you know that's all cook I the eggs with. in the bacon whatever it yeah. doesn't matter so, what it so looks you like you understand what i'm trying yeah, to say yeah, but as far 100%. as the bar my i am so blessed because all my staff my bar staff is probably my most tenured staff mm-hmm. you know we have you know uh megan caitlin tony aaron you know um you know, we had this young lady, Annie, but they're so they're into the way I'm into food is the yeah. way they're into that. Right. And that's, just, you know, that when they go to work they're they're you know, we might not be open for, for an hour. So they use that as a, that's like their time to experiment, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you know, they're, they're bouncing ideas off each other. So I am very blessed to have that kind of, you know, I, you know, they're following, you know, obviously they're following the business plan and the system, but you know, that can't be coached. Right. You know, that's something that they bring to the table, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, it's shout, a character out, to trait. Yeah, yeah, shout out to them because, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're not just there to t- take orders and pour drinks and follow a recipe. They're there to have that creative outlet as well. Right. It's you not know? just a job for them. They're it's, really no, taking I, pride in it. Yeah. They're there and they're going to make the most of the time there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know? It's awesome. It, and it does bleed through. Like I said, like, every facet of, of the restaurant, everything bleeds through. You could really tell, like even, even just like the little private room, like we, we were in there once actually for the, uh, for the first Friday thing I, I do with my, my friends. Like we just, I don't even know if we asked for it. It was just maybe the only table that was available that could fit all of us. And like, even that room, like the way it's, designed with the big glass and like so like you feel cozy and you're in there with your intimate crew but also you're still very much a part of the restaurant like you're not down in the basement or off in this little side room and like you could hear through the walls what's going on like the fun of the floor and the the pizza bar like you could still see everything that's going on in the restaurant just with the luxury of like having the door cracked and and you know being there with your your intimate 12 people or whatever it is and 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 that was the that was the goal with that, mm-hmm. and, and that and I you know that was one of the things we you know we could say oh look at yeah. you know it worked out yeah um, because yeah that's that room is, is is a hot commodity I mean that's that's booked out way in advance and oh, I bet you know so you know we're blessed to have that you know and that was an accident yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> when we decided we have to put that room there that was the design because that when there's the electrical chase for the whole condo building is right next to the bar where oh, that okay. metal flame is yeah there was no way that was being removed oh uh, okay and the original drawing was to have the bar on the other side yeah and actually it was going to be one bar a pizza bar would have actually connected with oh, okay. the bar yeah and yeah. it would have been along that whole wall yeah um which was a really cool drawing mm-hmm. and that was the original drawing but then once it got in the, the mechanical stages the like actuality the, the, of it the all. actuality of moving all those mechanics and all those pipes over would have been you know probably not double but you know what i mean a huge yeah. expense added so all right let's figure it out let's figure out for what we have and then they're it. like oh there's no getting around that so we're like right. oh let's put a private room behind there perfect and then boom yeah. That's how that became. And then I'm like, well, we need to make it where you still feel like you're part of the action. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It very much feels that way. Yeah. Um, one other thing, just circling back to the um, gelato that you have up front and uh, everything with that, just enlighten the people. So I'm not going to act like I'm like this friggin' whatever genius now because yeah. I had it a few times when I was in Italy. But 
it is so much better than ice cream. Yeah, I mean, I think and that's a I, I need preference. you to yeah, but I need you to explain like what I guess what is the difference and why might people find it quite a bit. Well, the, the science, than ice cream. the the science, and the difference from the science standpoint is it's churned at a lower speed. So there's there's like twenty five to fifty percent less air, mm-hmm. so it's dense. Mm-hmm. And then the other biggest difference is that it's served more at ten degrees than zero degrees. Mm-hmm. So they're your biggest difference. So the mouth feels different, and the texture is different. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's more concentrated flavor. But you know, when when I was designing the gelato recipes, I really wanted them to have them. You know, a little dense, a little more heavier. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit more salt, so it brings out a little bit more of the flavor. Mm-hmm. And we use a lot. Oh, it's all fresh ingredients. Mm-hmm. Like there's, we're not. You know, there's nothing. You know, if we're making a sorbetto in the summer, it's all the best fresh fruit we could get. That's the pistachios awesome. are all crushed, real pistachios. For the Sicilian huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's, there's, uh, there's no artificial flavoring there's going no, in. There's no corners being cut. <laughs> right. You know, and and that's something that was maybe that that didn't that didn't really get off the ground like I thought it would. Mm-hmm. Like we sell a lot of gelato, but in the summer. There's people that'll walk right by and don't even know we have it there still. Right. So maybe that's something I need to refocus and recenter for when this, you know, the summer comes to to try to ignite that program. Yeah. Because it should be appreciated more, I think. I agree. You know? That's that's my stance on it, and I feel like yeah, it is like sometimes just a knowledge thing and mm-hmm. and uh, people not being aware or like hesitant to try because they don't know exactly what it is, and like once they try it once, they were like, Damn. yeah. Now we we sell a good amount of it. Don't well, get me I wrong. Bet. It's just I, bet. That I, I feel that. I'd like to see people come in there and just get that. Right. You know? Yeah, you walk foot traffic, foot just traffic, stop in. Foot traffic, come in and get gelato and a soda or something, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But then I, I guess, you know, you see a patio full of people and then, you know, in your mind, you're like, I don't want to navigate through all this. Yeah. You know? So there's there's variables for sure, like anything else, but, you know, it's something to think about. Yeah, you know? yeah. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad you took notice of that because, you know, that was one of the focal points of the business plan was, you know, mm-hmm. we want to get that right. Mm-hmm. Get the pizza right. Get the gelato right. We know the pasta is going to be right, right, you know, but, you know, and then, you know, the espresso equipment and then, you know, let's build from that coupled with a tremendous amount of hospitality. Right. And, and you know, in service and then obviously mix in a cool environment mm-hmm. um, and then just go hard. Yeah. You know, that's that's the recipe. You know, it was it was a challenge to learn that style of pizza because I never worked with that. So. You know, I had to take some field trips. Yeah. Brooklyn, Philly, New mm-hmm. York. Try yeah. them all out. Yeah. And yeah. luckily I was connected with some chef friends that knew people that allowed me to go in and work. And yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it was that's fun. That's real cool. Um, I think that's a hell of a way to wrap um, everything you just said. But I do have like two more questions. I just sure. want to hit yeah, before no, I forget. My, I, I'm happy to be here, man. Um, it's a cool Tuesday. Is there? Yeah, it's a good way to spend yeah. a Tuesday. And like, I know you don't get many days off. So thank you again yeah. for coming up on your... Uh, on your one night off probably, but no, that's fine. Um, is there anything to the wheat in Italy versus the wheat that we're getting in America, like the heirloom wheat that you might be getting in Italy and like what it might do to like gut and inflammation versus yeah, so the some Italian of the shit wheat, that we get served here. Yes. And, and you feel different, mm-hmm. you know, you feel, you, you know, you feel different when you eat pasta in Italy than if you eat pasta, say, uh, say boiling a box of brilliant brilliant off your, off the, shelf mm-hmm. just because of the just because the way things are now in american agriculture you got to read the labels mm-hmm. you got to really dig deep you know if you're if you're health conscious and you care about that right you know because um that's that's um that's the direction that, that food's going now mm-hmm. you know there there's chefs that are now involved with farmers that are involved with scientists that are developing their own seeds mm-hmm. And that's the reason why food is the, the prices are starting to climb because mm-hmm. now you're now it's it's not mass produced right it's like small batch you getting know? more into like regenerative farms yeah. and stuff in, like in that in Italy they call that the slow food movement mm-hmm. right um, and that started in Piedmont and it's you know and it's and it's all about sustainable food from the seed mm-hmm. right yeah so so you have to be careful and i'm not sure scientifically of what, scientifically of what chemicals that the american wheat is being treated with but i know that's a thing right and i know that's you know it has to be it has to be uh, um something that is listed as one of the ingredients i think anyway legally yeah i don't know enough about what it is but i know that is a thing and, I and know, you've experienced the feeling in Italy I, versus yeah, one, 100 percent. 100 percent. yeah it, it's um so when I try to make my pastas and I do my pasta classes, I'm very mindful of using 
as many Italian products as I can. Mm -hmm. And I'm very mindful of making sure it's truly organic. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You definitely do feel a difference. And, uh, I think a big part of it is like when you see like enriched or like enriched with anything mm -hmm. basically is when they start really, it's a loose term, with right? It. Yeah. Yeah. Very loose. And then, yeah, like it's, it is unfortunate because again, like this kind of circles back to like the whole like local thing. It's like, if you could, if you were able to consume things, I'm not saying like rewind a hundred years and, and, you know, like agriculture, like we need certain levels of agriculture that exists today, obviously to feed 300 million people yeah. or whatever in the United States. I get it. But there's tons of areas for opportunities where you could support local farmers to some extent. I'm not saying you're going to get all your wheat or, or everything from a local farmer here in Northeast PA, but there's a there's a benefit to be had from from consuming those things not only on the relationship level like we were touching on earlier but the physical level too because corporate america and big agriculture basically has messed with products so much just to keep the bottom line where it is yeah that we're paying the price for it now like so many people have gi issues and, and gut health issues yeah and, everything and it, like then that. it stems and it's to like, the pharmaceutical it, it, you know what i mean it, yeah it, it goes it, everywhere and it's like so, you look at countries like italy and other who have uh tighter uh restrictions on some of the things that they're producing and like you look at you just look around people are healthier skinnier yeah. like be, more active, better off more, more energy. Act, right yeah it's you know? an it's a trickle down effect too. It's like you, you lose energy and then, you know, it takes 20 years. And then mm -hmm. next thing you know, you're a hundred pounds overweight. It's a, yeah. Stuff like that really irks me. Cause it's just like, well, diet we've, is we've, so, yeah, diet is everything, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, people sometimes are just, you know, naive to what they're putting in their system. Yeah. I try to be very conscious of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a cook, you know, we have probably some of the worst eating habits. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But just get it where you can on the yeah, fly. Yeah. Well, you're tasting as you go all day. Right. And, yeah. and you're tasting things that probably shouldn't work together. And, and, <laughs> you know, but you ever stumble across some good combinations? Yeah. Though, or? That, that has happened. There more, more bad ones. <laughs> yeah, you know, I bet. You know, but you know, you, you have to be mindful of that. You mm -hmm. know, to, to think about um, what you're eating on a day to day, like you said, and, and reading labels and trying to support local. And, and it's not easy to do that. No. It's expensive and it's yeah. effort. You have yep. to put the work in. Like if you're, if you go to, you know, like a, a, a better grocery store and go to their or organic stuff, it's probably going to be more money, mm -hmm. you know, and then you got to go home and you got to put the time in, right. you know, you got to meal plan or follow a recipe or, yeah. you know, everything you got to want to do it. You got to right. want to do it. Everything that's convenient you pay a price for basically mm -hmm. like your, your bars and all that stuff versus making a home cooked mm -hmm. meal. And, and yeah, it's just like, we've strayed so far. Like we had things going the right way. Like everything we ate was organic because organic and non-organic wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. Everything was just organic mm -hmm. because there was no fucking with it. Yeah. And now, and then like we got away from like the family time and making uh, like even just like slow Sundays, mm -hmm. like big meals, home cooked stuff versus, you know, hustle, 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 eat something on the fly. And then it's like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like that's where I get frustrated. Like we've come so far as a society and in so many facets and then like the one thing that we're doing every day and eating is so ass backwards to an extent that yeah. it's frustrating. Obviously, this little podcast is not yeah. going to fix anything, but um Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people are frustrated with the system right I, now. I I I think so. I think craft is coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm hoping. I think I have a feeling and I think that I think that you know, from from me being in the industry, I feel that the small, intimate, thought out, you know, in, you know, really ingredient focused restaurants are going to end up, they're going to be the ones that make it. Yep. I you agree. know, they're, they're going to be the ones that people seek out, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, growing up, I never ate out, No. you know, we ate out for a special occasion mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, fast forward to my time at the club, you know, people eat home for a special occasion, right? It's flip flop. It's so cyclical. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I would be hired to go cook their christmas eve dinner because they wanted to eat at home that one time of year right but they still hired a cook right versus take out or go yeah you know what i mean yeah so yeah. so i mean growing up it was it you know there was few rep there was a lot less restaurants a lot less good restaurants because there wasn't a demand for it mm -hmm. now like you said everything you know everything's in the fast lane mm -hmm. you know people are too busy to go home put something together yeah that's why i try to do the sunday suppers i try to you know i want people to sit there have their phones put away and have conversation like you would at, right. at a sunday supper yeah uh, like like you said a large meal dinner table it's, um, it's the best it's, yeah it's, and, and appreciate what you're eating talk about it yeah you know 
uh, maybe argue a little bit. That that's fun. You yeah. know what I mean? Whatever, yeah. whatever. You know, yeah. and and true Italian style. You got to argue at the yeah, dinner table. Yeah, you, you a get as loud bit. as you could. You yeah. know. So yeah, I try. I try to think about that. You know, when I do those dinners, that you know, I'd like to see that come back a little bit more. But not giving up hope. You know. You yeah. Know, you, you know. So. Yeah, I think it, everything is cyclical, and it's going to circle back around. Where, um, you know, like we, you go from the home cooked meals to then like the fast food industry was so big and now i think like you said like craft is going to come back in the restaurants that are really putting in the the time and effort and and sourcing their ingredients um responsibly and thoughtfully um are going to shine and yeah i think um it, 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 quality over quantity man yeah you know? yeah for sure you know that's you and, that, and that's why i respect what you're doing you know you could put any garbage out there on your website and be like mm-hmm. oh man he's, he's a cool dude but i'm not buying it if it's not quality right and i don't want people to come to Barpazo if it's not quality yeah you know what i mean yeah get, you, you, know, you might get, fool people once but they're not going to come back yeah. simple as yeah. that yeah and, and and that's the thing you mm-hmm. know be consistent be quality driven and you know give people their value mm-hmm. you know so cool man yeah cool one last one fun one if you could cook for three people dead or alive who would they be All right. one meal one dinner for, for three, three people. people first one was definitely my my um my drumming idol growing up neil peart from rush he passed away but i would have definitely wanted to cook for him cool i saw you uh, did a, not to go on another tangent but you did a rush night yeah at, yeah what was that sabatini's yeah that's yeah, cool so fun that's awesome i've been waiting to do that dinner since the 80s <laughs> i just never, see when i do the special events it has to be food number one focus is the food yeah so i never had a really reason to do that dinner mm-hmm. but then when they when you know getty and alex teamed up with with henderson they start figuring out how to make these interesting beers i'm like boom there it is yeah i could build around those beers it's awesome and linda was so cool to work with and we we're gonna try to do something together again so cool yeah that was a fun night um second person would probably be chef charlie trotter he's another one that passed away he was my you know biggest inspiration growing up i ate at his restaurant twice he was a two michelin star chef innovator philosopher check him out charlie right. trotter i mean he's, trotter. he's he's set he set so many standards um, in American dining. He was the first one to do a lot of things, pioneer. And we're talking late 80s, early to pre-internet. Mm-hmm. And people were traveling internationally to go eat there. And I ate there twice, 20, 2007 and then 2011 in the kitchen. Oh, really? In the kitchen. Wow. Yeah. So That's neat. Yeah. Yeah, man. That was, I felt like I was in the presence of Bon Jovi. <laughs> like I was like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, As a yeah, young cook, and I see time. him walking. Like the when he walked in the kitchen, the temperature of the room just changed. Like it was really, like, it was like Darth Vader walked. Really, on. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, so you yeah. got to return the favor, cook for him. What would, oh yeah, what would you make him? Oh man, I would probably do something really Pittston. Yeah, you know, because he's never run. had anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I and like I, it. And, the, and the third person, honestly, um, it's not. You know, it's not really. So there's there's probably many people that would fall in that category. So I'll just say my family. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a good go one. for my family. Yeah. You know, but but um, yeah, there, there you have it. You know? Awesome. Yeah. Cool. We could story tell you all a story tell all night. Yeah, for sure. Know? We'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, That's man, all. Bring me back. Yeah, we'll yeah, definitely have you back. back. Would love to. Well, uh, Corey, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank yeah, you again for coming it. up. And, uh, appreciate it. Best, best of luck in your endeavors. I know you're a busy man. You know? Yeah. Hey, you too, you'll man. Be, you'll be getting married in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Things might change. Then. <laughs> 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 well, you go to, you're going to go to Mexico. So just, you know. Yeah. Try and take, come back in one take, piece. Take, take <laughs> yeah. I've heard a lot of stories. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so fingers crossed. All right, cool. Man. Thanks awesome. again, John. All right. Cool. Yeah, I was stumped with the third person, but...